Welcome. Aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. Much as I know you folks love to hear and think and listen and talk about the politicians, we're going to skip that today. We're going to talk about generative artificial intelligence, the tools it offers, the risks it poses, and some thoughts on how and whether some kind of constructive balance might be possible. We have with us David Larson, former chair of the ABA section of dispute resolution and esteemed professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in the Twin Cities, and Jeff Portnoy, leading First Amendment lawyer, senior partner at the Cade Shuddy firm. Not everyone remembers, but Jeff has done his time as color commentator on University of Hawaii sports as well. So, gentlemen, what do you think, we'll start with you, David, what do you think are the most important points, priorities to keep in mind as the AI revolution inundates us? Well, there's, there's a lot to talk about. Um, you know, if you haven't played with AI at all, I encourage you to do it. Uh, I haven't used it a lot, but I have played around with it. And um, I, I got some surprising results. For example, uh, I asked AI to write a story for me about a Swede who didn't like Ludafisk. And if you know Scandinavian traditions, um, you know, Ludafisk is well entrenched in Scandinavia. So, you know, a Swede that doesn't like Ludafisk is turning his back on tradition. And it wrote this actually sweet little story about this individual who didn't like Ludafisk and, you know, his neighbors would try and encourage him to try it. They were all very respectful. And then near the end of the story, some uh, new neighbors invite him over for a surprise dinner and they prepare Ludafisk in a different way and he decides he likes it. So it's a happy little ending. But it actually was written as well as a typical TV fare. And all I could think about was that, wow, you know, the Writers Guild is in trouble um, because to generate a simple story, I thought it did a pretty good job. So then I asked some other kinds of questions. You now I asked it about uh, affirmative action and about the Students for Fair Admissions, the recent case. It couldn't. It couldn't answer it. Said we don't. I don't have enough recent information. So it, it could not respond to that. Then I said, uh, Can you tell me what cases I'd like to? I should have on a on a labor law syllabus. Well, what are the what are kind of the the, the, the fundamental cases, the greatest cases? And uh, so it produced a syllabus, and for the most part, it was getting the kind of the big cases you think it would get. Um, but then it had a couple like environmental cases in there that had nothing to do with with labor law. So I, I guess the first thing is that um, there's great potential there. And I, for me, the, what I got was that kind of the creative side of it seemed seemed very promising. The analytical, data driven side was a little more worrisome that um, it didn't seem to be able to be as discerning about what kind of data was reliable and accurate. Um, so my first reaction is approach it with caution. Um, you know, don't rely on it. We all heard the story about the New York attorney who had uh, Chat GPT write his briefs and turn them in. Turned in that, that uh, the briefs actually cited what looked like legitimate cases, had proper um, citations, but none of the cases existed. They were all made up. Um, you know, so I, I know he was brought up for ethical proceedings. I don't know what the sanctions were. Um, so, so I guess my starting point is uh, recognize that there's great potential, but be cautious. So, Jeff, have you tried it? Have you tried anything on ChatGPT? No. So I come at this as a complete neophyte. Um, I did have an interesting little encounter with it kind of Anecdotally, I had a uh, service technician come over the house to uh, hang some photographs after I had some work done in the house, had to put the pictures back up. And we spent some time talking and he, you know, got friendly and he told me about his background and what he's doing here, here et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, we started talking about being a lawyer and, you know, are things being taken away from lawyers? And I said, I, I don't know, not what I do. And he said, well, you better be careful because, you know, you're going to be out of business soon, friendly. And I laughed. 
And he said, I'm going to send you something tonight and you'll see. And what he sent me, he has a couple of properties apparently where he's a landlord and he was having trouble with a tenant. And he sent me a letter written by AI and a fictitious lawyer name to the tenant, threatening them with all kinds of sanctions if they didn't pay their rent. And he says, this is what it's going to do to a lot of what you guys do. So, you know, I, I am, a, as fans who watch me on your shows occasionally know, a computer illiterate. And uh, I'm not even sure what non-artificial intelligence is. But uh, I think there's a lot of hope. But I think there is a lot of potential damage that has been and will be done by AI if it is not, and I'm not sure anybody knows how to do this, properly controlled and monitored. And I know, uh, having spoken to a few professors, that there's real problems at the university level with students literally never coming to class and then writing papers that you know they probably even didn't proofread. But you know what's interesting? There's always someone else willing to step into the void. I'm told now that there are AI sites or whatever you want to call them, which can tell you which previous AI document is not accurate. So they're monitoring in competition each other. So that's all I know at the moment. Yeah, and just that's interesting. Of course, we may be getting situations of unauthorized practice of law and medicine. You know, as people produce documents that sound very compelling, very realistic, and they aren't. Um, so, but yeah, that's interesting. As, a, as kind of a first draft, you know, I think for a lot of lawyers, the idea of they're going to research a subject and maybe ask chat GPT or BARD you know, or something else for a first draft um, and see how it reads, check, check it all out. I think it can probably be helpful um, to doing things like that. But yeah, there are lots of problems. Um, you know, so a, a artificial intelligence goes beyond just chat GPT. It goes on to a lot of different areas. Um, you know, it does a lot of decision making for us. And one of the concerns about that is that when we defer decision making and directions to, to AI, there may be um, bias involved here. And there's a lot of um, statistics and research about the fact that, you know, AI is dependent on who creates it. And all humans have bias. So there's going to be bias in AI um, from the humans are creating it. And if you look at who are the, what's the demographics of the primary researcher, researchers, tend to be white, tend to be male, tend to be from higher socioeconomic classes. They're not people with disabilities. You know, it's a pretty homogenous group. So to the degree that, you know, you can't make absolute generalizations, but to the degree that when you have a homogenous group, there might be certain sensitivities and inherent implicit biases. That's going to show up in the in the AI, and, and that's problematic. Well, I know our law firm is prohibiting the use of AI. And uh, if someone's doing it and we catch them, they're not likely to be in the firm very much longer. Like you, I know about that case in New York. I've read the decision of the trial judge, which is, very pointed and very direct, recommending very significant sanctions to having it turn it over to, I think, the Bar Association in New York City. I'm not positive where. But uh, it's an example of what can go wrong and where a lawyer just completely gave up only all of his or her responsibilities, never even bothered checking to see if the cases cited even existed. And I think that's the risk you take. But, you know, if you're a... Uh, a senior at a university and need to write a paper to graduate and it's the night before the paper is due and you haven't gone to class for four months and uh, you're going to go to AI and you're going to take your chances. And uh, it's going to take a very smart teacher and a very, you know, smart set of eyes uh, or maybe even another AI site to say, this is garbage. This person didn't write this. It, it's not only not written by that person, but it's not accurate. That's the risk you take. Yeah, we're hoping that there can be like maybe watermarks or something to somehow identify. I know what some professors are doing is they're requiring some in-class assignments that uh, that you don't have the opportunity to use AI. And that's going to set a baseline. So you have people do some in-class assignments, and then suddenly on assignment number three, it's this wonderfully eloquent piece that's going to at least raise some 
suspicions that can you explain to me why you had this tremendous improvement um, this week as opposed to last week? So you know, I think there's some things we can do, but yeah, that's a real concern. Um, and Jeff, you talked about the fact that your firm's um, kind of monitoring that and prohibiting it. That's probably a good idea because we don't know where that data is going. Um, uh, you know, it's not really clear what protections there are for it, um, who can access it. And there was one case where it was revealed that some chat GPT users were able to access what somebody else has researched and the results they had. So I think there's some very legitimate privacy concerns about if you do use it, well, all that's getting stored. I mean, you know, the things you ask it, the things that are getting produced, um, you do it in your name, um, that those records are being kept. Where they're being kept, with whom they can be shared, we're not sure. Um, so, so again, right now we're in that, we're in these very early stages where some important questions need to be answered. Well, you know, I'm sure that there's tremendous potential for AI, maybe solving the secrets of the universe and whether there are aliens living on our planet that we're not aware of. But there are other things that I think are best left to the human brain, and that's where I think we may be going off the highway, uh, at least onto the shoulder, if not into the ditch. We see all the uh, positives and all the ills of social media. That was the big thing, and now AI has moved into that that uh, uh, field. And so, you know, with a lot of advancements over history, there's a lot of good, but unfortunately, sometimes there's some bad. And I think AI is falling into that category. And in the law, for example, as you know, technology is always two steps ahead of the law. So by the time the law catches up, the technology is obsolete. So we'll see how it deals with, with issues of AI. But I mean, it has, as I say, real potential to solve some major problems in the world, but it also has real potential to create those problems and exacerbate them. It certainly can, what it can do is, you know, digest and interpret data really quickly, massive amounts of data, much faster than you can manually. So that's a, you know, that's a great tool. Um, you know, it can be a great time and resource saver for repetitive tasks. Um, it can take over lots of those kinds of things. You're seeing it all the time already in customer service when you call in different um, merchants and retailers. You think you're talking with somebody, maybe you aren't. I mean, it may be an AI-directed AI conversation. Um, so, so those things are, ha are, are happening already. Uh, and I think that it can be a real productivity saver, but on the flip side, people are gonna lose jobs. Um, you know, one reason that unemployment has gone down through these past couple of years is there's been really a pretty explosive growth in relatively low-skilled, low-wage jobs. There's a lot of those jobs now. Well, I think those are the jobs that are probably most vulnerable right now to artificial intelligence. So to the degree that those jobs start getting replaced by technology, we may have a lot of um, a lot of economic problems in terms of unemployment. I mean, who even knows if I'm on this call? <laughs> or you? Chuck may or may not be on the call. I mean, you know, we, we've seen what people can do with AI by putting people's faces and having them mouth things that they never said. And, you know, we've seen the evil that that can cause and has caused. And it's just the beginning. I mean, it'll be robot talking to robot, but it'll look like you and I talking to each other. And people can do that right now. I've seen a whole documentary on it. It is really, really scary where I may not be saying one thing that I'm saying right now, and it may not even be me, even though it's my face and my mouth moves, and we see what's happening with animation. But right. unfortunately, it's happening now throughout the internet. And so, you know, we know what happened with Obama, and how do you put a stop to that? What do you do? What if what if the president is, uh, is uh, somebody phonies up the president getting on AI and saying that a nuclear bomb is coming? And and panic ensues. I mean, we're only one step away from something like that happening. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and as we approach another presidential election uh, in twenty twenty, you're not supposed to bring that up. No, you're not supposed to bring that up today. Remember? <laughs> yeah. So no, we, we can't. Well, just I'm not going to talk about the candidates, but I'm going to talk about <laughs> you know the, the 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 threat of those deep fake, fakes that Jeff's talking about, um, where you know, you're going to present somebody very convincingly 
saying things that they don't, you know, they've never said. Um, and that's, and, you know, our ability right now to, to kind of fact check and monitor that isn't very good. So I think there can be some serious chaos um, as we go into this, in this so, or our current election season. Um, you know, another thing that's, that's a little worrisome, maybe more than a little worrisome, is another thing they're doing with AI is uh, is autonomous weapon systems um, that uh, you know that can be deployed that ostensibly can make the decision of what targets to hit. Um, you know they can determine is that a civilian site, is that a military site, is this somebody uh, that's a combatant, is this somebody that's injured on the field, is this somebody um, that's trying to surrender? Um, you know, can it make those kinds of determinations? But we clearly are, we have autonomous weapons. We're moving much more towards that world where robots can take on not just warfare, but all kinds of dangerous tasks. I mean, to have robots go into the coal mine, that's probably a good thing. You're going to save some lives doing that. Um, but the idea of, of, of robot warriors who actually can identify and eliminate um, targets is, is kind of disturbing. Well, you bring up the economic potential problems and the loss of jobs. And, you know, I was on the phone today with a call center. I'm not sure I would have been better off with AI. But having said that, uh, you know, there are thousands and thousands of people all in the lower economic strata of our society who have those jobs, manufacturing jobs as well, that are all being taken over. Now, is it new? No. I mean, we went through the Industrial Revolution. And we're going through other revolutions every time the century mark changes. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to, to really figure out what the long-term ramifications are. And so uh, certainly we're not going to be able to solve it. I don't think anybody figured out yet how to solve it. And it's just going to be trial and error. Well, you know, in terms of job placements, we know that new jobs will be created. And, you know, these are speculative assessments. So people are predicting how many different jobs will be created. Yeah, that's fine. But it's not going to be a one-to-one -one situation where if you are currently flipping hamburgers, you're going to be able to take the next high-tech job that's available. Um, there's going to be some training issues there. As people in low-wage jobs are replaced, are they going to be qualified to take the new jobs that are created? And all that's going to do is really increase our social and economic inequalities. Yeah, well, I don't have much more to add here, Chuck. I mean, it's a uh, it's a brave new world. And uh, Alexander Huxley was uh, Aldous Huxley was correct. Uh, you know, how many years ago? Sixty. Uh, and he never even envisioned this. But I guess you can argue it's all in the name of progress. Well, you know, another thing to think about is that. China, which is a very authoritarian state, is using technology in all kinds of different ways to control its population. And they have a very extensive facial recognition program where it's not just in public public buildings. It can be in public open spaces, can be in schools, on streets, can be, they're putting it everywhere they can. Well, what's that, that allows them to do is then monitor everybody's movements and everybody's relationships um, and everybody's life. And they get a pretty good idea of exactly who you are and where you go. And uh, I think most Americans are very uncomfortable with that idea. So what are some of the, th do we, well, let's back, back up a little bit. Do we understand how generative AI really works? Is it building word sequences? Is that the way it works? Well, that's the problem, and that's the problem with a lot of science. Um, when you're trying to, when we have social scientists like lawyers trying to regulate uh, hard sciences, yeah, it challenges, challenging. You know, can we do it? I, I would say right now, no. Lay people don't really understand how this happens. Um, you know, we hear the word algorithms. Um, you know, do we really know how those work and how they're built? Um, in a simple way, maybe. Uh, but yeah, I think we're still at the stage where the regulators aren't well positioned, um, uh, or at least the, the ostensible regulators aren't well positioned to actually um, control this. Well, and Jeff's example is a good one because the one about the lawyer who put in 
a chat GPT analysis that had cases that didn't even exist without bothering to check that. Apparently, that is what happens, is if it hits a break in its linguistic pattern or chain, it, it will just make stuff up to fill it in. Well, I guess we're not going to be judges anymore either, right? We can just uh, submit the two briefs to uh, artificial intelligence and ask them to issue an opinion. Yeah, and that's a, you know, a, a, an issue being discussed now in the dispute resolution field, the ADR field. Is that, you know, are we going to have chat, GPT, and other artificial intelligence platforms resolving disputes on, a, you know, private disputes? Um, are they going to be doing divorces? Are they going to do, you know, property disputes? The kinds of things that you don't go to court for, haven't been going to court for, um, is artificial intelligence going to take that over? Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I did, I actually did put a question in about um, uh, my family members are, fervent, it's not true, my family members are fervent Trump supporters and Biden supporters, and they and they are frequently in arguments. Um, what can I do to bring them together? And it kind of brought out a whole kind of sequence, kind of recommendation as to what, you know, somebody experienced in the field would say are kind of predictable dispute resolution steps. But if you don't do dispute resolution, you haven't studied it, and you're not a mediator, you're not an, you're not an arbitrator, I think you'd find this, this exp explanation, the suggestion, very helpful. Um, so, so I don't know if that's going to start displacing uh, independent neutrals. I wrote an article way back in 2010 about artificial intelligence robots and avatars, the demise of the human mediator, that uh, actually got a lot of downloads, still getting downloads on SSRN. But that kind of was a, I hope was a kind of a prescient article um, looking ahead to what might happen. I mean, I don't think it's beyond belief that two parties could sit down before a computer, agree in advance to present their arguments and their cases to some artificial intelligence device and agree to be bound by the decision. I mean, I can see that happening. Yeah. Certainly cheaper. <laughs> and, and faster. Um, you know, that's one of the advantages, again, of artificial intelligence is you can get the quick quick answer. Um, you know, and if it's programmed properly, you can get a lot less human error, too. Um, certainly, that's that's an advantage if we're talking about manufacturing processes. The question, you know, if you're doing justice, um, for example, one concern you would have is that to the degree that we rely on data, and to the degree we believe that some of this data may be biased or have some implicit bias, that's just going to be perpetuated. And it's not going to be perpetuated, it's going to um, exponentially be increased. It's just going to get worse. And, uh, and that's, a, that's, I think, another concern about, about decision-making by artificial intelligence. So what if we took all of the presidential candidates and we fed in all the information and data that we have on each of them and asked generative AI to spit out its evaluation of its predictive presidential performance evaluation for each of them. Would it affect anybody? Would it change any minds? Would it be helpful? I think, it'd be fun. Yeah, I, I think the answer is knowing what 40% of the population believes already, uh, the answer is probably yes if they like the answer. <laughs> I yeah. mean, that's the problem, you know? You want to hear what you want to hear, and when you hear it, you don't care if it's true, false, or completely made up or whatever. So, But that's a great thought. Um, but, you know, you mentioned the word intelligence, and having watched the Republican debate yesterday, I, I don't think those go together. <laughs> well, and you've got... Six of the eight candidates standing up there saying they would back the former president even if he were convicted of any of the felonies he's charged with. Yeah, I mean that just that just sounds like classic cult <laughs> behavior that um, no longer can I think independently. Um, you know, I'm so wedded to our leader that you know I'll follow it to even my death. You know, I think there's probably people who believe that. Um, so that's that's very unsettling. 
But in terms of, you know, right now, if you feed it in, is it going to change people's minds? I I think it might be interesting to do and kind of fun to do, but I don't think we're at the point where it's going to change people's minds um, as, to, as to how they're going to, how they're going to vote. But I think it'll reinforce them if they like the opinion and, 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 the, and the conclusion and they'll discard it uh, if they don't. I mean, that's what's happening in lots of other areas other than artificial in, intelligence. You know, all you have to do is watch cable news and, and know mm. what they're pandering to. So, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a very, very difficult, I think, imponderable area that is just going to continue to develop and and we'll just see uh whether it brings more good than harm and right now i don't know i really don't know i think it's a, it's an unanswered question well you know there's money to be made you know and, and if history is any lesson if there's something that where there's money to be made it's going to be done um so i think this is going to be done it's inevitable um so to the, as challenging as it is, I think we're going to have to do everything possible to try to try and get ahead of it and try and regulate it. You know, I think one of the things we, we can try to do is just try and make things as transparent as possible. You know, how, you know, how, how does this work? You know, what criteria is this process using? Who's putting it in? You know, at least keep us informed as best you can as to what's happening behind the curtain. Um, I think that's one thing we can probably certainly improve on. Well, well I hear you. So. I hear you. We're, we're having enough trouble to figure out how to monitor and keep track of what's going on on the internet. So uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with this. But it's a fascinating topic. And again, I admit I'm a kind of a unintelligent person when it comes to it. I just don't have any interest in it. But I was fascinated by what this service person sent me. It looked like it was written by a lawyer that had three years experience handling landlord tenants. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. It's a power, it's a powerful tool. And as we wrap up for last thoughts, one of the questions is as compared to what our media provides in the way of information perspectives and analysis, maybe we're not so bad off with something like generative AI with a more comprehensive and possibly objective data source and analysis. Well, I, I, you know, I hear what you're saying. And I think it's a very valid point. Uh, I, I just don't think there's any answers right now. Like anything new, there's, there's so much more to be learned. And AI is just moving so much more rapidly than other technological inventions over the past hundred years. And it's outpacing, as I say, the law. It's outpacing regulators. It's outpacing the ability to tell what's real from not real. So I, I you know, repeat what I've said over and over. I think it's got potential for great good, and I think it's shown potential for great harm. Yeah, and I, I just want to encourage. Yeah, I want to encourage people to stay engaged. You know, as difficult and challenging and unsettling as it is. If we don't learn as much as we can and at least try to be involved with it and involved with the regulation, someone else is going to do it. And they're going to do it for us. And I'm not sure I'm going to like the person that's doing it and I'm going to agree with them. So I'm going to I'm going to work as hard as I can to to learn about it and at least to stay engaged. Hopefully all of us will be able to keep in mind if we can make it a tool that serves communication and understanding rather than one that directs and dominates or abuses it, there may be a balance. Uh, I, have to add, I have to add this. I know we're not supposed to, but you mentioned melting Minneapolis. All eight Republican candidates were asked to raise their hand if they believed in uh, global warning. Only one, Mickey Haley, even had the guts to raise her hand halfway. Right. <laughs> and, and, and she got booed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, great seeing you guys. Oh, well, that's what the, and I, I, I asked the AI, is, is climate change real? And it said, definitely. And then it went oh. through with a long explanation of why it is. So, so that, that was kind of gratifying. Well, that's, that's the reason then for 30% of the population not to believe AI. Maybe that's good. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, thanks so much. All right. Thanks Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for joining us. AI in our future. Take care. Aloha.